Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Shaw. I'm the executive editor of the Express News Group, and I welcome you to this debate tonight that we're sponsoring. Uh, we're going to try and keep it to a 90-minute debate because we'd like to get out of here before the skies open up. Um, I think it's not going to happen for a little while, so I think we have a little bit of time. But we have a lot of candidates on stage. I watched very closely last night at the Democratic debate to see how to manage such a big group, and I think I picked up a couple of tips. So uh, we'll be introducing the candidates here in a few moments, but um, I want to explain to the candidates uh, the format tonight, which is an open format. We're actually not going to have any time limits on any of the candidates. What I'm going to ask each of you is, especially with 10 candidates on the stage, I'd like to ask you all to be as brief as possible in your answers and concise. And I'm essentially going to be a traffic cop. Um, I, if, you're gonna, if you have something to say, raise your hand and we'll try and get people in order. You're allowed to have a conversation. This is meant to be more of a round table conversation than a, than a standard debate. Uh, you can talk with each other, you can ask each other questions. Let's keep it civil and let's keep it friendly. Um, but I don't think that'll be a big problem. But I'd ask you, with each of your answers, to try and stay within a minute or two. I will gently warn you if you're going on a little too long and I'll get more and more aggressive as time goes on. Uh, and, we'll try and we'll try and keep it flowing so everybody gets a chance. I'm also gonna ask the candidates, I'm gonna do my very best to give each of the candidates equal time but I'm going to need your help with that. You're going to, you're going to need to raise your hand, and, and if you feel like you're not getting enough time, catch my eye, and I'll give you a chance to respond to some of the questions. Speaking of the questions, uh, we'll be asking some of our own, but I also have some that have been submitted, and I'd invite the audience to submit questions. I have a stack already. I'm going to do my best to get through as many as we possibly can. There are index cards in the back. Uh, if you want to fill out a question to submit it, you can just walk up and give it to me. It's a small room. I don't think we need to stand on ceremony here. Um, I would ask the audience a couple of things. Please don't speak. Don't applaud. Uh, it's just going to slow things down. Um, and I, I would also ask uh, that you stay out of the center aisle as much as you can because the cameras are there for CTV. Uh, that'll get in their way. Okay, so um, what we will do is we'll go left to right. Um, starting uh, with Mr. Bro uh, Brosnan, and we'll give you a minute or so to introduce yourself to the crowd. Okay, uh, should we stand, or? Uh, it's, up, it's up to you. No? Oh, no standing, no, no standing, apologies. <laughs> no, no problem. Uh, my name is Captain mm -hmm. Andy Brosnan. I am currently a research vessel captain at SUNY Stony Brook, Southampton. Prior to that, I had a 20-year career in city and county government. I was director of child support enforcement for Rockland County. I was, prior to that, I was the assistant director of the Office for the Aging, and I started my career with the city of Miami Beach, writing grant proposals for the renovation of Ocean Drive and the designation of the Art Deco District. I have a master's degree in public administration from Florida State University and I have a 100-ton master U.S. Coast Guard license, and uh, I've had that for 10 years now. I was previously the chairman of the Eastern Long Island of the Surfrider Foundation. We were instrumental in lobbying for the ban of plastic straws, polystyrene, and the intentional release of balloons. We also organized beach cleanups that removed tons of plastic from our ocean beaches here on Eastern Long Island. I got involved in uh, politics, um, was requested to run by the Democratic Party. I am eager to join the Board of Trustees here in Southampton, and uh, I look forward to this evening's debate. I thank uh, everyone who's hosting here this evening, and thank you, CTV. Thank you, Cap. Uh, Thea? Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Thea Fry. I'm from uh, Hampton Bay, uh, New York. I'm raising my family, and I have a husband who's sitting back there. Um, I have, was born and raised here in Watermill, uh, right around the corner on Seven Ponds <coughs> Town. Currently, I'm working at Southampton Public Schools as the teaching assistant in the testing room. Uh, I'm on various, various committees. A lot of you in the room know me quite well, so you know I'm on the FAA committee. I belong to Ducks Unlimited. 
Um, I could go on and on and on, but I want to keep it under the minute. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see what else. I think that's about it for now. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to you, okay. promise. Fred? Hello, I'm Fred Havemeyer. I live right down the street from here, uh, third generation Southampton. I have two grown children who went to the local schools, Charlotte and Freddie. Uh, I have been uh, very networked since childhood into Southampton, the environment, our waters. I was one of the early surfers here. I have been a sport fishing captain of some note in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, I hold, at that time, an ocean operator's license, 65 tons, 85 miles, District 1. That's Nantucket to Cape May. And I was one of the uh, fishing captains that opened up the uh, uh, continental shelf fishing here. Donnie Law has known me in that capacity for a long time. Uh, I've been on the bays, uh, shell fishing, and uh, I'm a surf fisherman right to this day, as a matter of fact. I served 12 years or, or six terms on the town trustees as one of your trustees. And my area was from Shinnecock uh, Canal and Inlet to Town Line Road in East Hampton, including uh, north to the Peconic Bay section. Uh, I firmly believe that having served on the trustees for a very long time, that it's vitally important that the people who are on the board and who want to be under on the board understand what it's all about. In other words, a trustee is someone who is in the position of taking care of your assets and your rights. It's not fun for them. It's not their game, it's your game. They represent you in a very, very important way. Uh, I'll just wrap up by saying when I was on the board, I was instrumental in doing a long list of very important environmental and infrastructure improvements for the Town Board of Trustees. Uh, I'm on the ballot, Libertarian, please vote for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Megan. Can you hear me? Okay. You can bring it over if you <laughs> I didn't know if this was close enough. My name is Megan Heckman. I'm very excited to be here. This is my first official uh, debate event besides those that I have with my four-year-old at bedtime every night. Um, I reside in Eastport with my husband and my two young children. I um, am an avid voter with my family. I'm very excited to have this opportunity because I want to preserve the maritime communities that we have here on the East End for my children and for future generations. Um, some, of, some issues that are very important to me are water quality, beach access, and also financial stability for the trustees. So I hope to have some lively discussions here with everyone tonight, and I appreciate you all coming out in this not so great weather. Thank you. Scott. Can I move this over a little bit? Yes. Is that okay? Hi, I'm Scott Horowitz. I'm currently serving uh, my third term as a town trustee. I'm currently the secretary treasurer of the Board of Trustees. I served two terms prior on the Town Conservation Board working on wetlands <coughs> applications from uh, a different perspective. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree from Southampton College in environmental studies. Uh, and I'm also a graduate of the Suffolk County Police Academy. My first job working for the town as a part-time bay constable. I worked out on the road for the town and I worked for the state police as well back in the day. Uh, I currently do hold a 100-ton master captain's license and I'm the founder uh, of the Hamptons Offshore Fishing Tournament, which has uh, raised a couple million dollars for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Long Island, where I sit on the board. Taking care of community and children is very important to me. Uh, sitting as a trustee, you're faced with a lot of issues, and Mr. Havemeyer is correct. You're not the one that's having the, the fun. You're trying to protect and take care of everybody's resources. Since I've been there, we've taken on some of the toughest problems that the trustees face, the Mecox management plan situation, trying to get stability in the, in the financing and funding of the trustees to take care of infrastructure. Um, and I think that we've made some great progress, and I think there's a lot more progress that we need to continue to work on. Uh, and I look forward to uh, having a nice conversation with folks tonight. And I'd like to thank everybody for putting this forum together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don. Good evening. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, I'm born in, not in Hampton Bays, but there's a nice picture of me at three months old at Skipper's Cottages with my mother. And so I guess I could say I was pretty close to that. I live here in Hampton, well, in Hampton Bays all my life since then along with my wife Anna for 45 years. We have three children, we have four grandchildren, and they unfortunately, like some of the people here, uh, couldn't afford to live here. So I'll get into that in a little while, but um, 
My first job for the town was an ocean lifeguard in, uh, as a sophomore in high school, a junior in high school, then as a senior. And then later on, uh, right after that, I got married and uh, went upstate North Country Community College, but upstate is not the ocean, and I really missed home. So I transferred to Southampton College. There I lasted two weeks, because on Southampton you turn around and you see the beautiful bay, Shinnecock Bay and the ocean. Right then I was turned into the Bayman, uh, joined the Bayman Association back then, worked the bay, worked at a nice restaurant called Judges at night, and we just lived the great life that was afforded to us and right in front of us. <coughs> Then when things got real tough, I also uh, said I want to still be on the bay, but I'd be able to make some money, but I did it as a, a licensed Coast Guard captain myself. Going on 30 years now, this will be 30 years coming up, and um, my, my grandkids actually love it here, and the first thing they want to do when they get here is go to the beach or go fishing. And we have little names for about every little spot like everyone else does. And it's the lagoon, and when they can't talk, it's the magoon, and it's places like that. But these are places that are sacred to me and so dear uh, to, to educate these guys, and not only them, but their friends. So these kids, I don't want them to lose the access and ability uh, to come here and to use what we all use and make the uh, best time of our lives about. What was that? I no, that, that. Wasn't a, that wasn't a timer, but... So being, I just, one of the things, being a trustee, I, I ran last time and just missed, and uh, it's just too important for me not to sit back and watch other people. I want to be a part of it, and uh, my 60 years on the bay and fishing and clamming, hunting, I was a hunting guide just 1976 for the town, and what that did is uh, also introduced me to a lot of new people besides the fishing industry when you uh, take charters out. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to wrap up. So, is that okay? Yep. All right. Thanks. Bill. I want to thank Joe Shore and the 27 group for hosting this and the Watermelon people for coming out. It's not a very good night. Uh, I see some people got the boots on. They're gonna need them because there'll be a lot of crap flying around here later maybe. But anyway, um, I live in Southampton up in West Neck, and I spend most of my time if I'm not working on the water, on the bay, um, with my dog. If you follow me on Facebook, you see my picture of my dog all over in the creeks, clamming, scalloping, fishing. I'm in Montauk, I'm in East Hampton, I'm in West Hampton, I'm, I'm all over. Um, I manage houses out here for a side job and also chase geese with a dog, but my main passion is being on the water, and that's why one of the reasons I want to be a trustee, that's one of the reasons I am a trustee, because that's my passion. Um, I want to make sure that Marie can go out and get her 100 clams when she wants to, and Greg maybe can go clamming if he moves to the town, because he has no permit here, because he's not a freeholder. And that's one of the things about being in the town here. You're a freeholder. You're allowed to have a lot of stuff. And we don't want people who live outside the town to come and abuse it. And so that's why it's important to protect the, what the freeholders' right have in the Dungan patent. And um, I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Eric. Okay. Thank you for having us here tonight. I have a deep respect for the environment of this town, so much so that I, when I had the opportunity, I got appointed to the Town Conservation Board, now the Environmental Board, at that time at uh, 17 years old while I was still in high school. I served on that board for 20 years on a voluntary basis, when I was, even when I was going out to, going to college, I came back. And then I graduated up to the planning board where I became the vice chairman of that board. I served on that board for 13 years. And then my passion to, to be a trustee came true when Bill Bennett uh, retired. Uh, and I served on that board for 11 terms and was its president. I retired from the board two years, two years ago because I had a conflict of time in another job that I was contracted to for a two-year period. And uh, now I'm retired from that job and retired from my former job as a 
fire patrolman for the New York City Fire Patrol, and I was the union vice president there. During that time, I was reappointed 22 times unanimously by different town boards because they respected that I had the passion for this environment here. A lot of people have asked me to run this year because they're not satisfied with the actions that the town trustees have taken with the erosion of home rule and letting other agencies dictate policy. This is very important to them. And the lack of respect that this board has gotten lately, uh, just as evidenced by the uh, Aguam Lake situation last week. Now, contrast this with a few years ago when I was president, when we took on the DEC, we had six other towns that had the respect for us to join with us to take on the DEC to fight the fish, saltwater fishing license, and we won that case. I don't think that that would happen today. So a lot of people have encouraged me to run, and I pledge that if I do get elected, I would only run for one term and try to get the board back and use my expertise to try to get the board back on track and uh, develop respect for the board again. Okay. So thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Ed. Good evening. My name's Ed Warner, 60 years old. I've lived in Hampton Bays my whole life. Been married to my wife, Kathleen, 38 years. I have two wonderful children, my son, Daniel, who's following in our family tradition of being a waterman bayman, and my daughter, Megan, she works at the UN. Um, I went to uh, Stone, uh, Southampton, no, I went to uh, Suffolk College. I got a marine technology degree, at which time we were graduating, uh, Professor Smith said, well, I got good news and bad news. The good news is you all graduated. The bad news is starting pay is about $10,000. Well, coming from a Bayman family, first thing I did was go back home, get in my boat, and start clamming and fishing, learning all the waters that I had grown up on from my grandfather and father teaching me. It's a wonderful experience. And one of the duties that trustee, the trustees are mandated, I would say, is uh, preserve the maritime heritage, whether it's commercial, recreational fishing, hunting, or a whole host of other stuff, beach driving, that we oversee. Uh, one of our most important assets is the bays, the 26,000 acres of underwater land that we hold in trust for the, everybody in this town. I take that very seriously because the day that I was asked to become a trustee, my good friend John Semler and Scott Strau, another trustee, stood by me at my father's funeral, asked me if I could be a trustee, wanted to be a trustee. He said, something this is your father has always wanted for you. Well, I always thought my dad was going to be there, and the trustees were going to always take care of us. Well, after that, I realized that it was my time to step up, use my institutional knowledge of being a fisherman, the local waters. I know all the waters from East Hampton to Eastport. I can close my eyes, and I can pretty much vision the bay bottom. So I'm going to take all of that knowledge and a good working, hard working ethic and being able to work with many different agencies, which is a trustee's biggest asset. You know, it's not only working with the town board or working with uh, the supervisor or working with <coughs> state legislature. It's working with the federal and everybody else to accomplish what we have here, keeping this place great. So thank you very much, and I appreciate your support. Thank you, Ed. And last but certainly not least, Anne. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, I startled you there. Hi there. My name is Ann Welker. Thank you so much to all of you for being here tonight. Thank you to the Express Press News Group for sponsoring this. That's a mouthful. It's just Express now, actually. Oh, excuse me. Yes, that's okay, Express <laughs> News Group. Um, also to the Watermill CAC. Um, and also thank you to CTV. It takes a lot of hard work to make things happen outside of town hall so that it's possible for those of you who are not here tonight to view this at home. So thank you, CTV. My name's Ann Welker. I'm a Southampton Town Trustee. I am just completing my first term in office. These past two years have been a steep learning curve for me. This is a very complicated position, and I have spent a lot of these first two years reading, listening, watching, building relationships, so that I might, if elected to a second term, continue this work. 
I grew up in Southampton. I went to Tuckahoe School and to Southampton High School. When I graduated from college, I was lucky enough to be able to return to this area. I now am employed as an exercise physiologist in a cardiac rehabilitation unit. I hope that were I to be elected again, that I'll be able to continue this work using what I've learned in the past two years to carry forward with my passion for water quality, to build upon the relationships that I've made in the past two years, and also to continue to inform and educate you, the public, the residents of this town, about the issues that are so important that the trustees are involved with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ann. Okay, um, we are in Watermill, and so I wanted to start with a couple of questions that I think are of specific importance to folks from Watermill. And one of those is the Rose Hill Road controversy. The trustees made a deal to allow a neighboring property owner in Watermill to take over part of the trustee and own land at Rose Hill Road in exchange for maintaining the boat ramp and the access road, something the trustees were struggling to be able to afford to do. I want to ask the incumbents, and I'll start with Ed, and then Bill, and then Scott. Uh, I'd like to ask you three to answer it first. Do you still believe this was the right decision? And if you had it to do over again, would you vote the same way? Ed, I want to start with you. Um, at the advice of counsel, uh, I'm not going to answer this question. Once we get uh, everything cleared up with the town and the property, I'll gladly visit it and speak to it, but at the advice of counsel, we were asked not to discuss can, can I was you, asked not to discuss Can you speak in broad terms about whether or not you're, you're happy with the decision you made or not? Um, I understand not getting into specifics. Yes or no? Now, no. Um, what was the, the no? No. Uh, no, I'm not going to. I don't. No, you're not going to. No. Okay, no. fair enough. Bill? Well, I'm not afraid to talk about it. Um, I think that I, it was the wrong decision. I think the leadership and a town attorney were represented at, a, at the time. We trusted our leadership and the town attorney to, to guide the rest of the board. And um, they gave, gave us the wrong advice. And if I had to do it all over again, I would vote no. And I, I stated that right off the bat. And um, I regret it. And, and I hope someday that it goes back to what it was. I wanted to, a few years before that, I had a list of areas I wanted to make p parks. Um, and none of the trustees was interested in doing that. It's, if they were, maybe this would never have happened. OK. Scott? Um, yeah, it's a, um, obviously, when you have that situation with litigation, you got to be very careful about what it is that you say. I'm not happy with the project. Um, no one ever said that. The big question surrounding the litigation is, is it a park or is it not a park? Well, that's a good question because nobody ever represented that it was a park because it would have been a, a different decision at that point in time, clearly. Uh, you know, my understanding with this uh, project was that um, it was something that was in the works before we were on the board. And in the, with the facts that were presented to me to um, make a decision on, it was an encumbered piece of property by the town board prior and it had uh, some attachments to it with rights to drive across certain areas and go through a, a gated area um, and that that was uh, going to be eliminated and it was going to be a project that people wanted. I was in the understanding that they actually were so proud of this they wanted to name it after Eric Schultz for his work in time. That's what my understanding was at the time I made that decision and, and I looked at it no one said it was parked. Uh, it was looked at by the town board, to my understanding, and they were in favor of it, and then it got transferred to the trustees. Uh, it was looked at by the town attorney's office. My colleagues on the board that are assigned to this area were in favor of this. Some of them suggested some changes, like the clamshell uh, parking lot. Um, and, you know, we were in a situation where uh, we had very few people on staff with the Marine Maintenance Department. Funding has always been a struggle uh, at the trustees. There's a tremendous amount of infrastructure that has to be maintained. And, you know, we tried raising fees and we did raise fees to get more in line with the town. We did get some pushback on it, so we didn't get everything that we needed. 
And the reality was that we didn't have a tax line for stability. We, we were still taking care of Mecox. We didn't have use of the Community Preservation Fund committed to us at that point in time. And, you know, at the time it was an out-of-the-box solution that people seemed to be okay with. And looking back on it now, I wish we would have had more input. I wish we would have had the public input because I think things would have been different. People on the trustee's property is nothing that's out of the ordinary. We own the Bay Bottoms and just about every marina that there is in this town is on our property because we have to facilitate what's needed for a maritime community. Okay. Nobody wanted to make a project in Rose Hill that was going to upset anybody. People okay. thought they were doing something that was good, that wasn't going to stress the marine maintenance department, and that wasn't you know, would be a boat ramp that people could actually use from everywhere in this town and not get their vehicles stuck. Okay. You know, we, we tried to do something good, but I wish we would have had a public hearing, and I, and I think things would have been different. Okay. And looking forward, we're trying to fix these problems and work together so we don't get into these situations. And I'm sorry, Ann, you as well. I apologize. Um, this is a complicated, extremely unfortunate situation. Um, with the benefit, well, as since the trustees are involved with litigation, I cannot speak openly. However, um, with the benefit of two years now, um, looking back, I wish that two things had been done differently. Um, I wish that I had asked for that initial vote to be tabled so that I could have had the opportunity I'm a critical thinker, I'm analytical, I do my research, I ask questions. I didn't do that with this vote. And looking back, if I had asked for this vote to be tabled, taken the time to go through all those steps, things would have been different. The second thing that, in hindsight, should have happened was there should have been a public hearing. If the community had had the opportunity to speak, this situation would not have unfolded as it has. Okay. I want to open it up to the challengers. Eric, do you want to? You know, I realize the predicament that the uh, current board is in with not being able to uh, comment on because of litigation. Um, I think Ed remembers the same, we had the same situation with the uh, Dockers episode that went on for almost, what, four to six years or so that we could, we've sat at debates and we couldn't say anything. So I understand that. The thing that, uh, uh, the thing that concerned me was that the same attorney that was advising the trustees all this time was also advising the trustees whenever I had a dock that had to be lengthened for 10 feet out in Riches Bay, we had to have a public hearing. We had to have a public hearing if we changed the dates on scallop harvesting. We had to have a public hearing to change a comma or a sentence in, in the blue book. And this was never, this never went to a public hearing. And if, and fundamentally you have to be a historian when you're on this board. You have to know previous decisions. You have to read the books. You have to look at the, at the minutes. And when this first started, uh, when Fred instituted, and with a couple of other people, instituted the suit. I said, well, why don't you just look in the minutes of the town board and see what happened in 1943 at that particular date. And there it was. It took five minutes to see that it was, was supposed to be for public access and for park purposes. It's clear. So now the town board is now spending $30,000 on to keep this, instead of letting the judge decide of whether it's a park or not and whether it was legal to transfer it, they're spending $30,000 to stall and delay and to say that Fred Habermeyer lives two miles away so he has no standing. You know, just let it go to the judge and let him decide. And then if they'd done further research, they would have found out that they were prohibited, the trustees are prohibited from selling any land or alienating any land from a unanimous resolution of the town in 1698. This was a referendum at a town meeting where the population voted. And I have, I have it here if you want to read it. So, you know, it says that the trustees at a town meeting held by the inhabitants of Southampton on the fifth day of April, 1698, being the day of election of town officers, 
A general vote then passed that none of the trustees that now or hereafter shall be chosen by the town shall have the power to sell, alienate, or give away any land or make any title to any land already disposed of except empowered or directed thereto by the majority vote of said town. Now that's a referendum. That has not been revoked. We talk about the Dungan patent from 1686, how it's still valid. We talk about the Constitution of the United States. This vote's still valid. The trustees are not allowed to sell this land. And, and shame on the attorneys of the town for not doing due diligence okay. and knowing this. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Eric. I want to open it up okay. to the other challengers. And please, I appreciate it if we would, wouldn't react. I want to Joe, give everybody a chance to respond. Joe, can I just correct something there? Because the trustees didn't give away or sell any land. No title change took place. The trustees own all that land, and that was just a maintenance agreement with a sunset clause. The public has to understand the trustees still own that land that's in question. Okay. No, no title has changed. It's a, it's a maintenance agreement, and it will sunset, and it perhaps will be undone. I, I, I want to come back. I want to give the challengers a chance. Does anybody want to speak to this? Fred? Go ahead. I, I can't wait to speak about this. Listen, folks, I've got a bridge. Do you want to buy it? I mean, if I've ever heard more BS in, in a short amount of time, I can't remember. Uh, the park is a park is a park. It was uh, bought by the town for those specific purposes. Uh, February 10, 1943, for access to the bay and public use. And that's the way it's been used ever since. And many of the people in this room, their children, their grandchildren and all, have used that as a park. I said before, the trustees have a very important position in that they are administering your lands for your benefit. Giving the use of half of a piece of park land and virtually destroying the other part of the park. It used to be a beautiful grass sward that you could picnic on. Now it's a rough clamshell parking lot that you don't dare go and put your foot on unless you're wearing heavy boots. I mean, this is a travesty, ladies and gentlemen, and it is symbolic that this board, this current board, is completely, completely in the wrong place at the right time. Okay. And I ask you, to examine the situation carefully on your own, make your own conclusions, and vote in November to rid us of the vermin that we have on the board now. Thank you very That's, much. Maybe take, maybe take that down a little bit. We don't, we don't want this to get unpleasant. I, I try and avoid words Joe, like that. Joe, can I make one? I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you 30 seconds, and then yeah, I want to give the other challengers simple. a chance. If we had proper financing for our marine maintenance and uh, had a support from the tax line, we would never have entered in this, to this agreement. We were almost pushed in it. One of our maintenance guys retired, and then a month later, the other one retired. We were down to one maintenance and one part-timer. So we were trying to be creative and still manage the property that we hold in trust for everybody here. And we'll come back Could to I, the idea of, to that, we'll, we'll, be, we'll come back. Now, Fred, let me give some other voices a chance first. Uh, well, I was in charge Mr. of Brothers? that area for 12 years. I know it intimately. I will, I will come back to you. Excuse me, the maintenance required was so minimal. The plowing was done by the uh, highway department. The roads were taken, uh, the grass was mowed by the uh, parks department. And the only uh, cost was occasionally to dredge the uh, ramp there, okay. which cost three hundred and fifty dollars once or twice a year. Okay, let me get that some other let me let me get some other voices in. Do you, you want yes. to speak? Well, a couple things that I'd like to say. Number one, I think that before this decision was voted on by the town trustees, I think that it, that it should have been it should have been approach to the CAC, the Watermill CAC, and they should have been discussing this proposal and what they wanted to do. It should have been opened up to the public thereafter, and that wasn't done. And as far as the maintenance is concerned, I know there's a lot of issues that the trustees do need some sort of tax line so they can keep going, because at the point now where things are, the town board and the town supervisor could actually strangle and take all the money and finances away from the trustees, and then there'd be no, they, they would, there would not be any trustees. But what, what could have happened was we could have, the trustees could have gone to the Watermill Parks District and they could have talked to them and made some sort of agreement for the maintenance of Rose Hill. And that's what should have been done. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Brosnan? Sure. Um, you know, in the review of the meetings leading up to the decision by the Board of Trustees, it's apparent that there wasn't the appropriate notice to the public. There was not a public hearing. I think that that was a, uh, a big mistake, that the public should have been informed, the public should have been heard from with regard to this. And also, just briefly, with regard to making decisions because of poor finances, making poor decisions because of poor finances is not appropriate either. This idea of a tax line is seen, I think, a bit of a panacea. The tax line should be carefully considered before that is voted on and before that moves forward. You cannot simply create another, another governmental body out of thin air. There are costs associated with that. The budgets have to be determined as how you are going to spend that money. And if you are locked into a tax line with only a 2% potential for tax raising, you're going to have to raise those taxes unless you make critical decisions about how you are going to spend that money and if you are in fact looking to establish a new governmental body. With regard to Rose Hill, a public hearing absolutely should have taken place. Okay, well, and again, we'll come back to the tax line. Ms. Heckman, did you want to answer this? Uh, just to kind of touch on what Andrew was talking about, I think that a public hearing was absolutely critical and should have taken place, but creating another governmental body d absolutely has consequences. But I also think that oftentimes we have to get a little creative. I run my household budget. I have to sometimes take from one place to pay for another place. I don't think that um, a take of land is ever appropriate without hearing from the people that it's going to affect because there's always consequences. If you make one decision, you're doing something else. But I do think that sometimes when we have these public hearings, we can come to some sort of compromise or consensus so that we can get creative and have creative solutions and see where we can work with the private entities and the public uh, agencies to you know, finance these things and facilitate these parklands and beach access. I mean, these are roads that need to be taken care of. They need to be dredged. They need, you know, there are things that need to happen that we can't always pay for. And certainly, again, with what Thea was saying, the trustees' budget is completely encumbered in the town board, so we always need to be mindful of that. That could be taken away in an instant. Okay, thank you. Don, I don't think I gave you a chance yet. Well, I, th I think the optics of this deal was terrible. And they, anyway, we'll get to the process of what it, the town should have had was the public hearing, because in the public hearing, I think things would have been bought out, things would have been spoken of, and then they could have been investigated or literally voted on. So that's where I stand with the Rose Hill thing is it just should have been to the public and then with this, we wouldn't even be here tonight. Okay. Um, um, I want to give Bill 30 seconds. Did you say you wanted to add something to add or no? The, our secretary mentioned that the park was supposed to be named after Mr. Schultz. I found out about that in town hall, in the in a hallway, and I had to go to the president. And it says again, a lack of communication. Another deal in the back room between you three. I said, did you ask Mr. Schultz? No, it's a surprise. Don't say anything. It, don't say anything. It's a surprise. <laughs> I said, okay. So what did I do? I went outside. I says, Eric, they're going to name it after you. He said, I don't want nothing named after me because it's not my style. Okay. And then I went back to Ed. I said, you can't name it if you, after him. Okay. Um, I'll give you 10 seconds, Eric. Let's bear in mind. Microphone, please. Let's bear in mind the town, the town trustees are not blameless in this situation. There was no public hearing, remember, when the town board gave it to the trustees. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to another topic then that's also close to the heart of the folks here in Watermill. Uh, it's the Meacox Bay Management Plan that was approved last week. Um, 
The town's chief environmental analyst, Marty Shea, has raised several issues with the plan as it's currently written, and he wouldn't recommend its approval. Uh, the trustees still voted 5-0 to approve the plan after a four-year process uh, with plans to revisit some of those issues via amendments. Why was it so important after such a lengthy process to approve the plan with these questions outstanding? And also, does it make a difference that the CPF funding for making the cut itself might be potentially in jeopardy if the town hasn't signed off on this? I will throw it open to any of the current trustees who want to take that. I, I'll take it if you want, you want to take it. And I'll give you both. Yeah. First off, uh, this Mecox management plan, we work with all the stakeholders, multiple public hearings, um, getting as much input as we can, working with uh, government agencies from Washington, upstate, to really get it right. Um, I feel that Marty, by coming before us the way he did, basically was a little bit of sour grapes. Um, and he basically uh, said some stuff that all it would be in is an amendment on the permit going forward. He actually even threatened to take away the funding for the uh, Mecox management plan. Now, here it is again, our funding, just like Rose Hill Road, our funding. It has to do with the town board holding the carrot over our head and the funding. So we wanted the permit, we wanted, well, we wanted the management plan to acquire the 10-year maintenance permit to allow us to do inner bay dredging, which before I was a trustee 20 some odd years ago, almost 30 years ago, I met with my father, Bill Bennett, and several of the other trustees to get this permit to go in, harvest the stand, sand in the inner bay to make a channel that would acquire a good flow of water, water in and out so that we would not have to open the inlet as much as we did so we could have that bay functioning more like a, a traditional inlet than a body of water that uh, has a very small, uh, uh, meager kind of a cut that runs out of there. So there was a lot of thought reaching out to a lot of the stakeholders. I think we did the right thing. And moving forward, we can amend the plan at any time. And that's the key thing to remember. It can be amended. OK, Scott, you wanted to? Yes. Um, there was an urgency in, in passing this plan because the, the regulatory agencies have been putting pressure on this board for well over a decade to adopt a plan. And generationally, it's important for there to be a record so that future <coughs> boards can understand how to do this. A lot of being successful is with working with other people, working with other agencies. And one of our key folks at the Army Corps of Engineers who has to issue a permit on this is set to retire at the end of this month. And for us to have to go and reinvent the entire wheel when we could get this done and get this Army Corps permit in place, um, it was absolutely imperative. This is one of, in my view, one of the most important and one of the best things that we've been able to do for this water mill community. The, the effects on that Mecox Bay not being managed the right way has drastic impacts on the agricultural community here in Water Mill. It has drastic impacts on all the homeowners that live around that bay, commercial fishing and recreational fishing. Those comments, there was nothing in those comments that was going to be actionable in one week. There was nothing that we could do in a one week period of time. And as Trustee Warner said, President Warner said, we could go through them, we can vet them, we can add them into the plan by amendment if need be. But what I will tell you, I know for a fact, number one is that when that level hits a certain point, that bay has to be opened and it has to drain. It's detrimental, it becomes a toxic cocktail, it becomes a public health and safety problem, and it, it, it puts a lot of pressure on commercial fishing, the ecosystem, and the agriculture of this community. That has to happen. We agreed to close that cut mechanically. The Army Corps' view, or if man opens it, man should close it. They generally recommend 30 days to be mindful of sand transport from the east to the west, we want to maintain the biggest wide sandy beach that we can since we hold an easement there. We had the key points that were needed to be effective in managing Mecox, getting the permit in place, and eliminating the emergency protocols that are causing so much problem to the people of Watermill. The protocols that they've had us operating on the last five years are kind of like waiting for a call to hear you've had a 20 car pileup on the interstate before you send the salt and sand trucks out to get the road nice and uh, taken care of. It's wrong. We need the permits in place so that when we hit the triggers, we can take care of the Mecox Bay, take care of the people of Watermill, and then if it doesn't close naturally, we can take the action to close it. 
Okay? okay. To keep delaying this was not going to be beneficial for the environment or anybody in this community. Nothing was actionable in his comments in a one week period of time. If there's anything that the trustees feel collectively that needs to be added in, it is a living document. We will be more than happy to add them in. I'm gonna let somebody else. Okay, yeah, I actually wanna ask Ann. I think you ended up, you did vote in favor of the plan. You had expressed some misgivings, I think, along the way. What changed your mind to vote in favor? I was concerned about the remarks that Mr. Shea made. Um, I had not had none of the board had had the opportunity to review or discuss with him and I wanted to make sure that everybody was going to be on the same page. It's so important that the trustees be able to work with the town and I was concerned that there was a rift there. Um, that was why I specifically in that meeting said to Mr. Shea, would you be agreeable? And granted, it's not his decision, but we need to work with him. Um, I feel that um, there, without the efforts of a group of homeowners, residents around Meacox Bay, that this management plan never could have moved forward to where it is now complete. And the homeowners had been very effective in collaborating with the different governmental agencies. They were the ones who discovered that the gentleman from Army Corps of Engineers was retiring. They knew that if we were to let this go and he were to leave, we would be starting again. It's been approximately four years in the works. It needs a solution. That was, although not perfect, a temporary good solution, and we'll figure out Mr. Shea's comments. Okay. Bill, are you concerned at all about Marty Shea's concerns? Uh, yes, I agree with Ann 100%. Um, I agree with some of what Ed said to the last part. Um, I feel that we should have waited, uh, like Ann thought and said. Um, you, there is a rift now between Marty Shea and us, and probably with the town board. Um, there's a draft letter, which I have right here, which throws stones right back, okay? Instead of the letter saying, hey, we'll, take, we'll sit down and talk to you, we'll work it out, okay? It's like picking apart his thing. He, he worked on this for two years, okay, with all the town people, with the bay, bay, bay men, okay? Public hearings, talk to us, okay? Basically, the lawyer we had, the town attorney again, threw all his stuff out and wrote a legal document, okay? Can, can I ask you, Bill, what's the letter? I don't, I, I'm not sure I understand what the letter you have is. It's, it's a draft letter which was written by the secretary and our town attorney, I mean our personal attorney for the thing, um, rebelling against the Meacock management. And like, responding to Mr. Shea? To Mr. Shea, and it's, it's not, it's, I can't really show it in public. Uh, it's fine. Um, but it's not a very nice letter. I, was, uh, I would not sign my name to it. I was like, this is a good way to, to put a big wedge between the town and the trustee, where we're supposed to be working together, solving our problems, a good leader finds the problems and settles it. Okay. Not put a wedge, it's like, I'm more powerful than you, you're more powerful than me. You're gonna take my money away, I'm gonna do this, okay? I'm, I'm okay. sorry, but I don't, I don't see this this way. Um, if I could just jump Briefly. in Briefly. Sorry. Um, listen, I was involved in this thing for, for three terms of getting this thing done for the, for the folks. And we have a very good working relationship, in my view, with the Environment Division. And I had conversations with the supervisor right after we adopted this. And I've heard a lot of commentary that was very grateful that we've adopted and taken this role. The Environment Division is substantially overworked. They have a lot on their plate. There's files stacked up in there. We offered, we were pushed by the agencies and the community to get this job done. We offered to hire a consultant and take the data and, and, and have that data boiled down into this plan out of Marty's office because they're so busy. He refused to give it up, okay? Well, two years went by and everybody's looking at us saying, you guys gotta get this done. We are elected officials beholden to the community and we have to do what's in the best interest of this community and the environment and we had to get this done. Very respectfully, we will work with Marty. He agreed at the hearing that 
he he realizes now that it was a living document and that we could work together to put these things in we had to write a rebuttal because mr shea went and sent a letter to every regulatory agency under the sun so we have to answer the letter to straighten that out. I had to make phone calls to our congressman. I had to call our state senator. I had to call our state assemblyman and explain where we were and why. Okay? okay. So there's a lot more backstory that went on here. All right. We did the best we could for the water mill community. We weren't going to let it languish anymore. We did the best we could for the environment. And we will work with everybody to make it better. It's a living document. I'm okay. Sorry, That's fine. That's fine. That's good stuff. Um, I'll open it up to the six challengers who wants to address this. Fred? Yes. Uh, the Meacock's Blame Management Plan. Uh, when I was a trustee, again, I, I retired from the board after 12 years. I had been in charge of Meacock's Bay and the openings thereof and the waters and et cetera for virtually 12 years. We didn't have any problems. The bay was healthy. Uh, the cut would be open when necessary. There are two important criteria that control opening the cut. One is the salinity. You don't want the salinity to get too low on the, in the bay because the shellfish will die. And number two is the height of the bay. If the bay gets too high, it floods the fields and it floods people's basements. And you know immediately from the people when it's getting too high. There's no question about that. Uh, what we have in front of us now with all this elaborate wordy discussion is making something ultra complicated out of something very simple. It's uh, making an environmental situation, which it is, uh, a political situation. And uh, what we have in front of us is that the town trustees worked for a number of years with Marty Shea, the chief environmental officer for the town, who is an excellent person and a brilliant man. And when it came to push and shove at the end of the whole thing, they just undercut Marty Shea and walked away. It's basically what Bill said. That's, that's not the way to work. It's so easy to work with, uh, just be a second. It's so easy to work with a town government when you have a mutual interest in an asset. The town board and the supervisor are just as interested in a solution as the trustees and the people. And to make it into this complicated, wordy, 90-page document mm -hmm. is such gross overkill that it's actually funny. Okay, I want to give the other challengers a chance. Before, wait, just okay. for a bit, Bill. I want to give the challengers a chance here. Anybody else? Yes, Megan. I just want to comment. I don't think it's as cut and dry as perhaps Mr. Havermeyer is saying. I think maybe, perhaps when you were on the board, there were less regulations. I'm not sure, but um, I know just having spoken to you know my running mates and the other trustees that there was a lot of constituents that were involved in this decision. The farmers were suffering. I watched the last board meeting. I saw Mr. McGregor. I saw Mr. Halsey up there. Please help us. So I think that sometimes what can happen is, and I'm not saying that analysis is not always necessary because it is, especially when you're spending other people's money, but you can really have you know, paralysis by analysis. You have to take action sometimes. If you have a living document that can be amended, that can be changed, you need to pull the trigger and make changes going forward. You don't shoot from the hip, but you have to make a decision. You have to take a stand. You have to help the people that need it the most. Okay. If I just may say Absolutely. Something. The management plan, I mean, we need... Thank you. <laughs> I'm not loud enough. Um, the, <laughs> um, we, need, we need to smile a little during this thing. Um, the management plan is a good plan. I, I agree. But again, we have to put things simple again. Meacox Bay is the heart of Watermel. It goes all out into all the other bay, the, all the other ponds, freshwater ponds in um, Watermel. We have to protect that. This plan, we may not like every point in this plan, but there are the majority of the points we do because it protects Meacox, and that's what we want. We want to protect Meacox, the residents surrounding Meacox, and we want to protect the ecosystem of Meacox because if Meacox dies, Everything else around it will die too. So keeping Meacox in an equal balance is what we need to do at all costs. Okay. I, I just, uh, huh? I was at that meeting and I was sitting next to Mr. McGregor. Uh, he had mentioned, and you had mentioned, um, you guys had somebody that was close that you could have given this to that was going to retire pretty soon, and he had mentioned. Um, I forgot that gentleman's name, but I had written down. 
And I said to myself, get this document to him right away if, if, if there's a problem with it, because I've, I heard both sides of the story, and they're, and they're both valid. Everything is valid. It's just that if there was something that needed from the DEC or the Armored Corps en Engineers, this would have been my, my first thought is, all right, let's get this plan to him and see what he says real quick, because I guess you guys waited another week, if, if I recall, or that end of the week, Thursday, to any of the amendments, but that's... That's what I, I came out of that meeting thinking that, okay, if you, if you have to do this, let's do it. Just, just don't bicker about it and get these, all these valid points, both sides, get it done with and, and then go back. Don't bicker back and forth, I'm going to cut your uh, funding, I'm going to do this and that. That to me was just a waste of time and it's still a waste of time because we have what? We have this big weather. We had just had a bad weather. We have Northeast and we had, you know, that would close it most likely if it did was open. But, uh, you, you, can't, you can't play tricks with Mother Nature, and you need, everybody needs to be on board, so you, you don't have these issues. Let me give Mr. Brosnan a chance first, and Eric, and then I'll come to you, Ed. Um, I guess this is where my experiences with SUNY Stony Brook and with the Surfrider Foundation come to bear. And Meacox is one of a number of ponds that need to be maintained and need to be healthy ecosystems to help the baymen to help the environment. Uh, Meacox, you know, we now, thanks to the trustees' vote, have a plan in place, but it seems to me that it's a very good thing that it's a living document. Mr. Shea's uh, comments uh, regarding salinity, regarding the amount of time that the cut could remain open, all come to bear on the idea of opening and closing Meacox. Simply height and salinity will no longer do it. And one of the things that has been done is that there is now a buoy in Meacox Bay with various scientific instrumentation in it that will monitor it continuously and provide that data to everyone in a public format. If you go to Friends of Georgia Capond, you can see a similar data set that they're using in Georgia Capond to control that. Not only do you have salinity and height, but you have dissolved oxygen, which are crucial to the shellfish and the crabs and uh, other fin fish that reside in that pond that need to be monitored and need to be considered for the opening and closing. And it's not as simple as it used to be in terms of just being able to say height and salinity. You've got piping plovers that have to be considered. You have other varied considerations. Certainly height should be one of those primary considerations, but I think we need to look critically at that document, to look at the data, to look at the science, and not release things like enterococcus bacteria in high concentrations into a potential swimming area when the beaches are crowded. You know, the cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae, when that encounters a high salinity and a lower temperature, that is almost instantaneously killed and dissolved. But things like bacteria, like enterococcus, which come from a variety of sources, if released into the ocean, do not readily dissipate. And if you look at Surf Riders' website, you can see enterococcus samples uh, that have been done for the past five years at 50 sites throughout eastern Long Island. Okay. Thank you for that. Eric, did you want to answer this? Meacox Bay has plagued the trustees' decision-making process for years, years and years. There's, all, there's so many different user groups that either want the bay high, want the bay low, want the salinity up, you've got to uh, concern yourself with the shell fishermen, you got, there's, there's so many different factors, and, and any of the trustees that are served will attest to that. When this first came up, I spoke to uh, Supervisor Schneiderman, and he counseled us as to say that, you know, you should keep the document simple and basically just say what you've been telling all the rest of the trustees. It passed down to Fred by word of mouth. That's how it worked. Okay, we generally want the salinity to be at this level. We don't generally want to do, we want to lower the bay when it's at this level and keep it as simple as possible, not a 90-page boilerplate document with, with all these recommendations at the end. Keep it simple. Now, 
What you see here, though, is the insidious creeping in of all these different other agencies. I don't know, a lot of people don't realize that there was an act of the state legislature in 1906 that gave the trustees the sole right to open up an inlet at Meacox and also gave them eminent domain power to seize a piece of property if they felt that they needed to cut it in at a different place and to create a committee to compensate the landowner for the damages. Now the DEC says that they have the jurisdiction now, but they won't put it in writing. And I asked several, several times uh, when I was on the board and no one, and, the, and the, again the attorneys said, oh no, they have jurisdiction. I believe they don't. There's too many agencies involved in the decision-making process, home rule is being eroded, and the trustees need to be more flexible because Meacox cut is a living, breathing organism. Every time that's opened, it's a different set of parameters. They have to be flexible. I support putting it in writing, not to, be, not to have your hands tied, but I support a plan of some sort, and that gives the trustees flexibility. Okay, thank you. I'll come to you, Fred. I'm going to give Ed a chance first, and then I'll come to you, Fred, um, briefly. I, w I was through the whole process. The first meeting we had at the DEC headquarters, there was 14 of us at the table. A year later, there was a very similar meeting. There was 14 different people from, you know, di people from different agencies. And they wanted, and Marty Shea was there, and two of town attorneys, and they wanted a document that encompassed the whole entire watermill watershed area. They wanted a holistic approach. Basically that document that's 91 pages, I take it, look at it, and probably 10 pages are pertinent to what the trustees need. Those are the, that's the meat and potatoes of that document. The rest of it is uh, you know, basically upland sources and other issues that Marty was asked to incorporate in this document by the other agencies. That's how it came to be like it is. And, and speaking about Meacox and the management of Meacox, I mean, there's no one in this room, maybe uh, Mark Zalewski or a couple of dunk cutters, that spend more time on Meacox than I have in the last 30 years. I know that place like the back of my hand. And just to let you understand that, you know, it's, it's a balancing act. The tide is high, that means everybody on the east end of the pond is high, happy. Everybody on the west end, are unhappy. Their cellars are flooded, their toilets are backed up. So you've got to balance it. And in the time I've been on the trustees, which is about 12 years, we now have blue-green algae. It wasn't there when I was first on the board. So we've come to get another host of problems to manage it. So that's why the Meacox management document is a living, a living breathing, functional document. Okay, thanks, Ed. Ten seconds, Fred, real quick, because I'm going to move on. Can I add my... Very quickly. Very quickly. Uh, in response to what Mr. Brosnan was saying, at the time that I uh, was in charge of Meacox Bay, we had five stations around Meacox Bay that were monitored at least twice a week with a uh, meter that gave both salinity readings and dissolved oxygen readings. So it was done by the Bay Constables. And those readings were put in my box and the other trustees' box twice a week throughout 52 weeks a year. So we the testing were completely was backed up by what was going on with Meacox, as well as the height <clears throat> gotcha. and all the other circumstances. Okay, very quick, Bill. I just want to say, um, this Monday, the next meeting, trustee meeting, we are gonna have the first open discussion about setting a, setting a time to amend Meacox plan. Um, they originally wanted to do it in closed session. I said no. and mean in the mean the um, president there had a little disagreement Joe stepped in and said no it has to be done in open it cannot be done in executive session it has to be done in open because we don't want another Rose Hill okay to the public okay can well, I just say something real briefly sure with regard to the dissolved oxygen it's a cyclical uh, it, it it goes up during the daylight hours it comes down at night so taking a snapshot of time at one particular time of the day doesn't give you necessarily an accurate uh, depiction of dissolved oxygen. That's why the continuous monitoring probably is so important. Understood. Okay. Bill, I'm actually going to direct this next question to you to get the conversation started. Uh, I want to talk about the separate tax line for the trustees. And it's a, it's a big issue, and it's also been around for a while. Um, to make that happen, state legislation was required. 
Assemblyman Fred Thiel did his part in Albany, but he later pulled that legislation because the town didn't follow through with official support of the proposal. Mr. Pell, you spoke against the idea to the town board, even though you have said you support the idea of a separate tax line, and the town board pushed off the necessary vote as a result. What were your reasons for that? The reason was, the, the reason was that I kept in the X and our board members, our leadership, I said, what about this, what about that? And they, and they kept and shut me down. The secretary shut me down, said, oh, Mr. Pell's trying to say this. So I just gave up. I went to the town board because I had the opportunity. I get along good with the supervisor and the, and the town board members. And I asked, I said, I don't think it's a good idea because I want to know what, what's in the tax line. I want to know what the, the buybacks are, the chargebacks, what, you know, what's going to happen. Okay, if we run short of money, do we have, to, we have to up our fees? So instead of paying $30 for a four-wheel drive permit, you might end up paying $60. One of the ideas was, okay, we'll charge the, the marina owners for using the bay bottom for their slips. Okay, so if you can charge the marina owners for square footage for their slips, then you've got to charge the people who have slips behind the house to help raise money. I don't agree with that. I want to know exactly what I'm voting on now. I made a mistake on Rose Hill by listening to the leadership. I want to know what's in it. And I don't want to, you know, the tax line, yeah, we need a tax line, okay? Maybe there's another way to do the, do the tax line, okay? But we have to know what's in it. You buy an insurance policy, you know exactly what's in your insurance policy. I don't want something, someone to sell me something which I don't know everything what's in it. Okay. Because the people do, do not deserve that. Okay. Scott, are you? Uh, the tax line. Like the single most important thing that the trustees and the people of this community need, especially, I'm sorry, especially generationally. You saw a threaten, uh, get threatened over funding for something as important as a Mecox management plan on television. This is wrong. We've had many conversations about this. It's trustee board's highly misunderstood tax line. It was explained. Right now, you are incurring those expenses. We are in town hall. We are using the information technology services. We are human, using human resources. We are using all of those services. You are paying for them in your general tax bill, and there's no guarantee that they're going to continue for the trustees. The bottom line was, it's already being spent now. It's not going to be an additional cost. The key was to get the authority to have us as a district, just like a fire district, and then we would sit down with each department, with the supervisor, with the town board, and determine, okay, the trustees use this amount of the town attorney's office, 60 hours a week. We use this much of IT. It's going on right now. That amount would come off of the general tax line and would move over to the trustees' tax line, and it would be locked down. Now, like some of my fellow candidates up here said, they can't take that away. They can't threaten the funding because it is locked down as a district, you can't just decide you're not funding the fire district or a library. It wasn't going to be an additional cost. The, right now, we're paying over $200,000 back for employees that were hired over the years that people thought was only for one year, but ended up in perpetuity. So now our enterprise revenue permit fees are encumbered by $200,000 going back to the town for employees that, by the way, we're not a bargaining unit, we really don't control, and in addition, when we're fixing docks and piers and ramps that we talk about, we have almost a million dollars in bonds out there that we're paying the debt service on back to the town because we have a good financial relationship. And these are resources, waterfront eat resources that are not just used by the trustees. They're used for everybody in this community. They're part of our quality of life. They need to be safe okay, and they need to be functional. So the trustees are paying all this debt service back for, for this, that was getting moved to the tax line. That would left all of the enterprise revenue that the trustees generate for permit fees. And remember something else, folks. When it comes to a lawsuit on the ocean beach to defend your public access, it's been the trustees' enterprise revenue that has been funding those. And if we have to go on the offensive, because somebody puts a fence that goes from their house right down to the water, it's going to be the trustees that have the authority to bring that action to have that fence removed. Not the village mayors, not the town supervisor, 
the town trustees. That means we have to have a very large fund balance so that the message is, if we have to defend something in the interest of this trust and the freeholders of this town, we're prepared to do that without having to beg any other board. Okay. okay? This okay. board has done what it could to be financially strong and take care of these assets. We've had to make some out of the box decisions. We've learned from them. We're moving on. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Don, I wanted to give you a chance because you had mentioned the tax line earlier. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, obviously it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. This way the trustees could do what they needed to do. The only concern I have, because I've talked to a lot of people, and Scott explained a few things, but it still has a, uh, a little cloud over my head about when, when prices go up, obviously the budget needs to go up. If the trustees have a lawsuit, like you said, or let's say two, now is your budget gone and now we can't uh, protect those ramps and protect the beach accesses or hire somebody or repair the uh, pump out boats and things like that? I think that's a concern of everyone sitting here. Um, it's, it's good when you know something. When you don't know, it's not because it then leaves a blank in your head or it gives you a uh, rubber, you know, like a uh, you don't understand it, so you get annoyed, or it's hard to explain. But once it's explained and we know, then I believe there would, wouldn't be an issue with the tax line. Okay. Let me ask everybody on the stage, um, is anybody not in favor of a tax line? Or the bill has expressed some concerns. Is anybody opposed to the idea of a separate tax line for the trustees? Fred, you want to talk about that? I'm, I'm not opposed, but I have very strong questions about it. You can let me talk or not on that. 30 seconds. Could I? Briefly. Uh, 30 seconds. Yes. 29, 28, 27. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, let's cut to the heart of the issue. Taxes. You're already taxed and the money goes to the trustees. That's a given. It's not like they're not funded through taxes. Of course they're funded through taxes. They want their own tax line. The problem with the tax line is over the last couple of hundred years, the finances of the trustees and the town have become so entangled that it's like the most incredible divorce that you ever heard of to try to separate them. Every department, everything, it's all the town. They actually have their office in the town buildings and they use the bank constables who are employed by the town and back and forth. And the, the heart of the issue is, is it more advantageous for the trustees to have their own tax line completely separated from the town or not financially to you as taxpayers? Are you saving money by it or is it costing you a lot more? And that I believe is the question that Bill brought up some time ago when it came to voting on it. Is it a cost benefit positive situation for the people? It sounds great, tax line, but it's going to cost you a lot more money. Okay. I gave you a little more than 30 seconds, Fred. I'm generous like that. I gave you a little more. <laughs> um, did you want to say something? Yes. After seeing it go down with the town board and our board last time, I really feel that we should hire an outside consultant to look at our finances, to look where we get the money from the town, and come up with the proper matrix of where everything is going so that when we present it to the town board, when we present it to each one of the board members, they understand it, and when we present it to the public whose eyes cloud over most times when you talk about taxes and tax line, they're, they're, they're not getting it. So I think for us to sell it to everybody in the town, hiring an outside consulting and going through each line with what we have on our, ta on our budget and the town budget and breaking it all down so that we can feed it to everybody very simply is the best way to do this. Very quickly, Eric. Okay. Uh, look, I was in favor of the tax line. Eight years ago, I invited Senator Laval and Fred Thiel to our office to discuss it, and they were unanimously opposed. I believe you remember. Not at this time because the governor was not uh, in favor of uh, creating new entities. But <clears throat> the purpose of the tax line was not only to separate the, uh, the finances so the, town, so the trustees would have, the, have their own finance and their own destiny and to be able to, um, to uh, 
defend lawsuits. It was also to elevate the status of the trustees. To put it into a municipal status would give us the ability to go out for grants. It would allow us to control the pump out boats. With, you have this elaborate situation right now where the, where the town actually owns the pump out boats, but the trustees run them. And there's this complex budget that goes on every year because we can't do it. And I, my line I used to say was, and I, you know, I agree with Scott with what he was, what he was saying, it's right on point, is that it's inconceivable that the oldest continually elected board in North America does not have the same taxable rights as a little fire department in the Adirondacks with a pickup truck. Amen. They have control over their destiny. As far as the finances go uh, as, as with litigation, you have litigation insurance, the same as the town does. You don't have to, that doesn't come out of your general fund all the time. But it gave us the power to, ha to be independent of the town board because we had a situation where we were, there were two previous town boards were prosecuting a suit with us on land issues on the western end of town, and the new supervisor decided not to fund the trustees. And that's what prompted this whole discussion. Okay, and I'm going to give you the last word very really quick. quickly. Of the five East End towns, Riverhead Town no longer has trustees, Shelter Island Town no longer has trustees. We are concerned about the sustainability of the trustees if they're not funded properly. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask for everybody's help now because I want to speed things up a little bit and get some, to audience, some audience questions and a couple of other topics. I'm just going to ask you to be brief and let me know if you have something to say. It's going to take too long if we go to, through all 10 every single time. So let me ask, first of all, there's an easy question here because we can do it by a show of hands. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Have you ever possessed a Southampton town hunting, fishing, or shellfish license? Yes or no? Can you raise your hands if you have? Uh, sure. Hunting, fishing, or shellfish license. I think you, yes. All of the above. Okay. Another question for the audience. This one's directed to Eric and Fred specifically. After retiring from the Board of Trustees, what prompted you both to run again? I'll let you answer first, Fred. You want me to start? Yes. Well, what prompted me to run is what I've been saying since I first sat down here is looking back, and Eric and I are still very close friends. We served together on the board. He was the president, I was the secretary treasurer for a number of years. We worked very hard to build up the functioning of the board, the financial situation of the board, the environmental integrity of the board for all of you and taking care of your assets to the fullest possible extent. And looking back over the years since I stepped down, I don't recognize the place anymore. It's not the same board, it's not the same motivation. The, the whole integrity is missing. And Eric and I talking together said, you know, we don't want to be sitting back 10 years from now and saying, why didn't we throw our hats in the race and try to straighten this mess out? And that's why we're here, because we have the experience, the knowledge, and the smarts to be able to do what we did for you once before all over again. And I want to reiterate something that Eric said, it's very important to me. If we are elected, we only want to serve for one more term. And within that term, we would like to, uh, bipartisan, bring individuals in from the community, set up committees, and train them and instruct them of what the trustees are all about, environmentally, historically, and otherwise. Because one of the problems that we have in this town is that very few people understand all the uh, very special things that the trustees do and how important they are. And we would like to have a small body, bipartisan, of people that understand what is going on and could be chosen as future candidates for all of you to serve on your board. Okay, Eric, real quick. I waited a long time to get on this board, and I cherished the time that I was on it, helping people and serving the community. A lot of people in the last two years have been approaching me and saying, why don't you get back on the board? We're not satisfied with all these agencies creeping in. We're, we're not satisfied with the erosion of home rule. We're not satisfied with a lot of things that are going on. This is not all the board members, but some of them. And like Fred said, you know, we were gonna, I didn't want to sit down and at least bring this, this 
to the public to open up this discussion, to force this, it, to force these issues there. And if anything comes out of it, out of uh, to bring these, bring this up, I'm satisfied. If I'm elected, I'll serve for one term, and like Fred said, build up communities, uh, committees, so people know what the job is, so that the next time around, when you have a board of trust of people that are going to run for trustee, they'll know what they're getting into. Okay, let me throw this one to the the challengers. Um, this is another submitted question. Uh, this person says that they believe the elected trustees should work together as a team of five and set aside party differences and work to educate new members on the issues and the responsibilities, listen to special interest groups but not be bound by them, fully discuss issues as a team, focus on the, what's best for the majority of the town. If you agree with this, how would you work to accomplish this idea? I'll start on the end here. Um, well, do you want to repeat that? You got I think the question is, it goes to the issue of bipartisanship right. and, and how important it is. And I, th I think the question is about working as a team with people who, you, who might be elected from a different political party. Absolutely. As, as a town trustee, the primary responsibilities are the bay, bay bottoms and beaches and all of the freeholders of Southampton. It's an environmental issue as I see it. And the partisanship of uh, political parties uh, I find a little disheartening with regard to the trustees. I think that the consensus around this table demonstrates to a large extent that everybody is concerned about preserving the rights of the freeholders to keeping healthy bays, keeping healthy waters. The question is, how do we do that the best that we absolutely can? And that would absolutely require cooperation, teamwork, and consensus building. Um, I've had experience with that with regard to Surfrider. Um, child support enforcement is certainly a contentious uh, arena. And as I said, I worked in that for nine years with a staff of 30, building that team, building um, consensus among divergent parties. And the same was very true with Surfrider. I think specifically what I bring to this is a more scientific approach and an emphasis on the environment and an emphasis on balancing the environment, not to overburden the commercial industry but to work with ways that we can establish healthy populations of shellfish and finfish in the bays so that everybody can make a living, so everyone can enjoy the resource, and so that we have healthy, clean bodies of water that we can all recreate in. Okay, thank you. Thea, I want you to answer next. Thank you. Um, I think the most important thing is that the trustees all work together, and I think that if the question is, can I work with the trustees, no matter what party they are, that answer would be yes. I don't look at a person and say, what is your political affiliation? I think that we can make decisions and have solutions for the freeholders that the freeholders want so that the trustee board continues to be a strong body for generations to come. This isn't something that lasts for two years. Everything that happens within a two-year period, that has an effect in 100 years. And we have to work together as a team, five people together. We can't be all this inner fighting. It doesn't get us anywhere. The important thing is also is that we listen to the freeholders. Every decision that we make has to, those decisions, you have to be the, the solution. You have to give us those solutions, and then we have to come together and we have to work so that we can continue on with the trustees and with their, their future and what the Donegan patent means to us. We have to keep that close to our, our chest and know how important that is. Okay. Megan. Um, so, in terms of bipartisanship, I think that, it, first, it's really important to remember that this is a legislative body, so if you're not working together, I mean, one trustee is 20% of the board, that's a very large number. You have to make decisions as a team. Um, but the responsibilities that are on this board, under the Donegan patent, they are driving the waterways, our shorelines, our bay bottoms, or the economic engine of this town. So, these decisions have a huge effect on the freeholders. and. I'm a taxpayer as well, so you know you got to you got to be smart about this.
but you also have to listen to the constituents, you have to listen to the public, you have to work as a team and make decisions that are smart for everyone. Okay. Um, we're almost to the 90 minute mark with everyone's assent, that includes everybody here and everybody here and CTV. We'll go a little longer, can we do that? Like another five or 10 minutes? Any issues with that, anybody? I just want to ask a couple more questions. Um, I want to talk about I, Joe. Could I just answer that? Since, Did you want uh, us to answer the same question, or what's that? I, I, I didn't answer the challenged question. Oh, so. if you'd like to, let's do that then. Well, All the more, I'll so, do, I'll, so I'll nobody's nobody's but, got a problem with staying. That's but, the question. Okay, that's you. <laughs> I'm friends with everyone on this board. I've known a lot of them. I've known Fred. When I worked on a boat, it was a mate. Fred was the captain. Since I was probably 14, maybe 15. I'm, now, Mr. Brosman, I met him this year and probably crossed paths in the ocean at one, one point because he was a little younger and I was a little younger. We looked a little different. You have everybody here. I work with anybody. I've always, you know, I've married for 45 years. That's not easy. <laughs> we have arguments, but guess what? You discuss them. You just lost the vote. I hope she didn't. Yeah. <laughs> you just lost the vote. I'm telling, I'm just saying, it's, you're going to have problems. <laughs> you work it out, you get it on. I know all these guys. All right, I'll leave it alone. <laughs> I appreciate that. Does anybody else want to want to but chime I, in I, on this? We have to remember that we're property managers. Politics should really not enter into the town trustees. It's unfortunate that we have to belong to parties and there's all this mm -hmm. trading of, of, of candidates back and forth with these deals that go on in the beginning of the year. It's, it's unfortunate. It really would be best to keep it. <clears throat> Keep it out, but okay. the main thing yeah, is communication well among all yeah. the board members. It becomes political because of all the complex horse trading that goes on in the beginning of the year. Gotcha. I'm going to give Bill a chance first, and then I'll come to you, Scott. Quickly, I both of you. I agree with everyone that there should be no politics, but it's very tough when you vote against something and or go to the town board, and the first thing the, the leadership says, "Oh, you did it out of for political." politically reasons it was not true okay they kept on going around town saying that you have two people who bring politics to the board and we never had that before I sat on the board before these people were, were leadership we never had any type of you know we had disagreement then we went out and, and talked about it and settled it um, like Fr mm -hmm. like Fred said he, I went fishing with Fred 35 years ago on a tiger holly we write that Fred? yeah I got, sure. I got seasick <laughs> I, w I went out with Don fishing a, a, a month or so. By the way, I got seasick again. Um, I, went clam with me. I went clam with him. And I know most of these people. The people out here, I know. I can go into the Jay's office. I can go into John Bouvier's office. I can go into Christine Sclair's office. There's, there's no politics favored by the town board to the trustee with me. Okay? okay. Maybe with the other members, yes. Okay. Scott. Okay. Um, leadership, you know, it's Eddie's been the president. I think he's done a great job. I've been the secretary treasurer. I feel that I've done a good job. Let's talk about something reality. Five zero. Oh. Both votes we talked about. Both issues you talked about here today were five zero. Oh. They were both unanimous votes. Meet Cox management plan, unanimous, right? Rose Hill Road, unanimous. Okay. So we voted for it, but now we're here getting criticized about it. That doesn't work when you're sitting on a board and you're relying on people's input for your decision making when you're making that decision and your colleagues are, are with you you know and then they're against you look we, we got to work together politics aside but please recognize that both issues that you brought up were both unanimously voted on by all five there's no majority here there's two republicans two independents and one conservative on our board this this run it was people working together okay Okay. Joe, uh, <laughs> what you just brought up is a prime example of too much politics in the trustee situation. The people that voted on the Rose Hill Road thing, uh, it was politics behind everything that went on to a certain degree. So you can't gloss it over and say there's no politics in the, in the uh, Board of Trustee thing. It's steeped in politics, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. and that's why we have the problems that we have. Okay. I want to talk about beach access before we leave here tonight. Uh, the issues come up frequently, and this year nesting pl piping plovers actually closed down the picnic area in Southampton Village to beach driving and parking for a time early in the summer, and that's obviously the only place in the summer that allows that. 
There's few issues that raise the kind of emotion that beach access does. So what is your position on the public's right to access the beaches via vehicle? Should that right be expanded throughout more town beaches, when, uh, either in general or when the picnic area is closed for any reason? I will take a show of hands for someone who wants to tackle this one. Ed. Um, we did expand the driving area in uh, Peconic. It went from 300 feet to 2,000 feet between Sabonic and uh, Cold Springs. And as far as the uh, beach driving uh, west of Shinnecock Inlet going to Ponquag, we actually closed the beach driving because the beach was in such poor condition. And after viewing some of the pictures that I've seen today from our chief environmental analyst, Marty Shea, and the town, I believe that uh, many of the areas are in great danger of losing the ability for people even to drive in the wintertime on the beaches. They're terribly eroded. Um, one thing that people have to understand, the reason that the picnic area is such a unique area, it's on the east side or the downdrift side of the littoral drift, and that jetty traps all of that sand. That beach is five times as wide as any place else in the town, so it's a unique area. It's you know, owned by private residences. Uh, the town, uh, the village has some property there, and the trustees has an easement. So it's been historically a wonderful place for 24-hour beach access. But looking at the beach, uh, the 26 miles of beach as a whole, there are very few, if any, areas that could accommodate that particular use. OK. Anybody else? Eric, the, some of the, the um, lawsuits that the trustees have fought uh, regarding uh, their their status, the, a lot of that surrounds beach driving. Correct? Has that been part of the part of the issue on that subject? No. No, not really. The way okay. I was involved, how does it? Uh, the, uh, beach. How does it fit into the to that whole to to the idea of the trustees having control of the beaches? Is that a bad? If that's a bad question, you can just yeah, skip it. Sort of, but All right. Let me, let, me, let me try to let me try to explain just one thing. Yes. Is that, um, Look, a lot of problems arose with the beach, and we should call it parking, not driving. There's two different things. Driving is what the fishermen do. Parking is what people do when they go down to the picnic area, and that gets confused a lot. Uh, the people in the picnic area are concerned because that is the only place where people are allowed to park, and it's right in front of their houses. And you can understand that. It's the same as somebody on a block saying, okay, let's put a, uh, let's put a basketball court, a basketball hoop up on the telephone pole. Okay, who's gonna, whose house is it going to be in front of all the time? All right, so these people are concerned that it's happening in front of their house all the time. So in order to dilute some of those lawsuits, it was felt that you could open up a section, say like Hot Dog Beach for a limited amount, so people from the west side of town could just go to Hampton Bays. Now bear in mind, Volusia County down in Florida has 20 miles of beach where you can park. And if you look, you'll see birds walking in between, you'll have fishermen, you'll have kids playing, and then if you turn around, there's an endangered species piping plover sign, the same ones that we use on a post right there. So, I mean, it's possible to park. These, these regulations that the Army Corps of Engineers, I mean, the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife have, as far as 2,000 meters or 3,000 meters away from a nest, are all recommendations. How do they do it in Volusia County, and we can't do it here? Okay. I want to ask one last question of the four challengers who haven't served on the board, and we'll go right to left. It's a very simple question. I just want 30 seconds. What is it that makes you uniquely qualified above all the other candidates to serve on this board? We're going to have one seat that's available uh, that will have a new face in it this time. So what makes you uniquely qualified over everyone else for that seat? Don, I'll start with you. One of the things is my uh, experience living here, and basically the water is my life. Whether I was surfing or fishing as a kid, but uh, it's the experience, the knowledge, and the able ability to work with other people. Uh, one of the things we did when we, when we did go surfing up and down all the way up to Georgia is we made friends with the homeowners. The reason why is because we wanted to surf in front of the beach in front of them. And I'm talking about, you know, 14 years old. So I learned at a young age to be cooperative with people and don't burn bridges. You burn a bridge, you're never going to cross it again. So one of my things is my love, my knowledge, 
my grandkids coming back, and um, hope you vote for me. Okay, Megan? So I have had the opportunity to serve on other boards in the past. I'm an excellent communicator. I work very well with others. Um, I also, just look at my notes here, I successfully grew two businesses here on the East End, so I'm very familiar with the community. I live here, I've lived here my whole life. Um, and the other thing is just the sense of community and knowing how important the Downing and Patton is. I want to stay here, I want to live here, I want to enjoy my boat for as long as I can. I want my kids to have that opportunity as well. So I think that the public often doesn't understand the great things that stem from this board, the trustees. So I want to be a part of that, I want to be able to help further that, and I want to help the public understand what the trustees are doing and what their responsibility is so that they can continue. I think if they had the support of the public, oftentimes we wouldn't have some of these issues that we're faced with. Okay, thanks. Thea? Well, um, <clears throat> I think the most important thing, and I um, disagree with Meg a lot, is that I don't think it's the public that needs to understand um, what the trustees do, because the public, the freeholders, are the ones that have entrusted the trustees to do their job and to take care of our almost 99, maybe 100 freshwater ponds and um, our beaches, our beach access. Um, and I think that's what is important. Um, and I think what I bring to the table is for myself is that the freshwater ponds, um, specifically the ones that are in Watermill, have always been very, very dear to my heart. Um, one project that I've been working on for the last year and a half is to try and list all 99 freshwater ponds as well as all trustee owned and access points in the town of Southampton um, because there isn't one list for the public to have access to. Um, and I've been working on that with a friend um, here in the town of Southampton. So I think what I bring to um, if, when I am elected as a trustee um, board member is that understanding my place in the world and my place on the board is that this job is entrusted to me by the freeholders and to respect that and to understand their concerns and to be available to them and to make sure that I'm always a phone call away. Okay. Andy? Um, hopefully, um, what makes me unique, you may have heard in some of the responses to the questions this evening. You know, I have a 20-year career in governmental administration. I have a master's degree in public administration. I'm well aware of the operations of government. And I've spent the last 10 years of my life as a boat captain out here at SUNY Stony Brook. I live in Hampton Bays with my wife Alejandra. I love it out here. I love the bays. My work with Surfrider enabled me to pass what I see as substantive legislation, to advocate and lobby for that. I'd like to bring my expertise with regard to the science of water quality and shellfish expansion and preservation fin fish expansion and preservation to the Board of Trustees, to work with the other trustees to preserve this beautiful landscape and the waterways that we have out here in the town of Southampton, and to preserve them for generations, but to make them healthy so that the baymen can make a quality living working the waterways, and that we can all enjoy the recreation of the beaches and I'm a big surfer myself. I want to meet some of his friends so that we can surf in front of their houses. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll talk later, Don. So, um, anyway, thank you for, and I look forward to your support in November. Okay. So uh, we're, we want to wrap up quickly. I'm going to give everybody, we're going to go the other way this time, Ann. We'll start with you. Just 30 seconds of a wrapping speech. We don't need, you, well, we can take the thank yous as written. You don't have to waste time on that. We appreciate you being here. Let's just make a last impression um, to the voters that are going to have to pick five of you uh, in this coming election. This was an excellent discussion tonight. I feel the questions were good and the responses were good. Um, I ha am deeply honored to have been elected to and to have served as the first woman on the Southampton Board of Trustees since 1686. I hope that you will continue. Get my, I hope you will allow me to continue. Thank you, Ann. Hey. Um, one quick, quick thing I'd like to say before I wrap it up is that the trustees have worked hard 
not to lose any jurisdiction. And one project that we worked on with the uh, governor was to accept uh, 1.5 million hard clams, 45 million clams and oysters on shell, putting them in Western Shinnecock Bay for 25 years. We did not cede one inch of our authority to the New York State DEC, and it's a wonderful project for the water, the environment, and for everybody in the town. And I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight, and I appreciate your support in the past. I hope I have it now, and I, if I am elected, I will work harder than ever to make Southampton great. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Thank you for this uh, meeting tonight. I'm very proud of the service that I uh, had for the, being on the trustees, and um, I'd just like to bring trust back to the trustees. Thank you. Okay. Bill. I got one already. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to everyone, and it's very important you, that you do your research on who you vote for. You can vote up to five people. You can vote for one, two, three, four, or five. They can't vote for six. Um, I like being a trustee, and I'm a team player. I'm on the fire department, and so it's very important. We need all team players, no politics, on a trustee board so we can get things done. And, be, and go back how we used to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks for your support. Don? Well, getting back to uh, some of what I said before is just knowledge and all the things I've learned as uh, a team player. Team player is you, you have a team with you and always helped out the team player, the one that couldn't maybe uh, do as good as he could or whatever. But you helped, and you made him understand something. You always took the best out of somebody, and that's what I do. And he uh, had mentioned his degrees. Now, I don't have a lot of degrees. My degree is in this bare area and its bays and oceans. That's why I'm a captain. That's why I'm, I was a bayman. That's why I fish. That's why I hunt. That's why I do everything that this place offers. And that's why I want to be a trustee, not only just for my selfish self, which is not, is everybody here in this room and my family. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Scott. Um, I would appreciate your uh, support um, for re-election as a trustee. I feel uh, differently than I, I hear from Mr. Havemeyer. Um, I think the board has got a great stature. I think being able to work with the town and getting the community preservation funding for Mecox Management Plan and other projects has helped a lot of people in the town. I think that we got that tax line passed through the state assembly last time, and we, we would have got it through the Senate, I feel, if we didn't run out of time. And I think we could accomplish that and really get stability on the finances for the people of this town generationally. Uh, I feel we automated that office. We, we elevated it. We've got it uh, where it runs much more efficiently. Uh, we went and worked with the community. We saved the Ponquag Bridge Fishing Pier, which I think was huge. Uh, we've got a plan in place to, to fix infrastructure throughout this entire town. And um, we've done that by working with everybody. And, you know, I know you're not happy with some of the decisions that we've made or I've made. And, and this goes with the territory. And I feel bad for that, but it does go with the territory, okay? But my heart is always in doing the best that I can for the people that I serve and for the environment. And I'm always very mindful generationally that the decisions we make are going to have effects in the long term. I fight hard for public access, and um, I, I want to stay on this. We have a, we've done a lot of great things. We've got a lot more great things to do. And I would appreciate your support for another two years. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Megan. I'm going to be a little more brief than Scott was. Um, <laughs> so I am honest. I will serve with integrity. I don't have any ulterior motives. I want to do this for the freeholders and for my children and for your children and your grandchildren. Um, I have made a lot of great friends since March when this whole craziness started. And that includes the people at this table. I know that I can work well with everyone. So I really look forward to your vote on November 5th, and I thank you for being there here. Thank you, Mick. Fred. Yes. Um, as I said before, I served on the board for 12 years. I know the job inside out, backwards and forwards. I actually live the job in my daily life, as do my children. For example, my son left early this morning in our family truck, four-wheel drive, and was down on the beach fishing, just like I taught him to do when he was six years old. And that's what's wonderful about this town. 
I intend, I would like to serve another term, as I said on the board, in order to perpetuate this wonderful, wonderful town for all of us and its assets. And quite frankly, the reason I'm here tonight is I can feel intimately the town board of trustees slipping away and disappearing over the next years because of a lack of focus and uh, improper management. And I would hate, hate, in my very old age to look back and see Southampton turn like Riverhead and Brookhaven and the other towns where the trustees have disappeared and become a function of the town board. So I would like to be back on the board to put your trustees back on a firm standing and do the right thing for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred. Pia. Well, thank you very much for having us this evening. We all appreciate it, and it was a very nice evening. Um, I want to say in closing that I hope that you vote for me on November 5th, and the reason for that is because I am a freeholder. I'm just like you. Um, I enjoy all the same things that you do, and I want to be able to preserve those things for my son, James Robert, who hopefully is home doing his homework, um, and for his kids and um, for his kids' kids. I think that's really, really important. Um, I'm a family person, and it's all about family to me. It's all about history, and it's all about what, what it will be like in two or three generations. And will I be able, will my family and my, aunt, my children's children be able to crab in the same exact spots that my dad did in Meacox Bay, or my great-grandfather or my grandfather? Those are things that are important to me. And I want to bring that sense back to the trustees so that they know that the freeholders, we are indebted to you, that's our job. Our job is to entrust and take care of this beautiful area that we call paradise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thea. Andy? Um, yeah, thank you for hosting this evening. Um, hopefully everyone got uh, some information out of this. If you'd like to know more about me personally, you can go to my website, CaptainAndyBrosnan.com, which my beautiful wife Alejandra does all the work on, so <laughs> I can't take any of the credit for that. But I love Southampton. I love the waters of Southampton. I love the people of Southampton, and I'd really like to work for you with your support in November. We can make that happen. And also, I know for a fact that winter is coming. There were five harbor seals on the bar out at East Cut uh, yesterday. There's still whales out in the ocean. The Manhattan population is back. There were a dozen humpbacks uh, just off the beach uh, the last couple of days. So if you get the opportunity, go out and check out what nature has to offer here in the beautiful town of Southampton. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to, I want to close by pointing out that the only time local government really works is with participation. And I think it's pretty amazing that we got all 10 candidates for trustee here tonight. They gave their time. I think they all answered very candidly. They faced the music when they had to. And I think they deserve a round of applause as a group for doing that. Thank you. And I want to thank the Watermill CAC for providing uh, the venue for this and to CTV for recording and broadcasting it. Uh, election day is November 5th, so uh, make sure you get out and vote. Thank you all very much. And thank you for coming out tonight.